Um, <clears throat> you've just turned in homework number seven. The next assignment is going to do, be due a week from today, so that's homework number eight. It's not yet on Blackboard, but I'll put it on this afternoon. Um, that was quiz five, and uh, depending on how things go, we'll probably be able to have three or four more during the semester. Uh, I'm beginning to be a little bit concerned that we may switch to electronic class meetings. Um, yeah. I, I just, I don't know. Like Speculation, but I think the coronavirus is probably going to shut things down more than people realize. Show You'll show up? <laughs> Anyways, I think we'll be well positioned to continue with the course even if they do switch to electronic because um, you know, we've done it before. We've had electronic class meetings, so I don't think it would ruin the semester, but um, it's been on my mind lately. So um, Today what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at some of the data sources that allow us to calculate curve number. And uh, later when you start using WMS, it will automatically fetch some of the land use and soil type data that's required to calculate a watershed's composite curve number. Um, but that's kind of a rare thing that that data is just automatically retrieved for you. And so I thought what we'd do is uh, look at where you could obtain that data manually if you wanted to interact with it outside of the WMS environment. And just as a refresher of why we need to know land use and soil type, consider the uh, curve number tables that we've looked at before. And so um, for us to know a watershed's curve number, we have to have an idea of what soil is in the watershed and what land use is on top of the ground. And there's going to not just be a single soil and a single land use for a given watershed. There, Even for a pretty moderately sized watershed, there could be hundreds of different soil type polygons and uh, maybe half a dozen land uses. And so um, I'll show you a table that we'll use when we get into watershed modeling. It's a curve number table that I created for West Virginia a couple of years ago. Let's see if I can zoom in a little. You know, that makes it slightly better. All right, these are the primary wa uh, land use types and curve numbers that we'd see in West Virginia. Now they'd have different land cover assignments in Florida because they have um, some things in Florida like swamps that we don't have in West Virginia. Um, but I haven't found a watershed yet that I wasn't able to calculate the curve number for in West Virginia. Uh, these are the land use classifications and so you'll notice first of all that there is uh, a number associated with it. And Assuming this download finishes in time, I'll show you what that land number, uh, the that number, how it's visualized and how it's how it's read, and then um, these numbers should seem familiar to you. They're the curve numbers for A, B, C, D, and so for instance, in open water, you effectively retain all of the um, precipitation. There isn't any storage in open water in the same way that there isn't for uh, you know, like developed areas. Um, and then in cultivated areas or natural areas, you know, like grasslands, you can see that the curve number would be as low as 30 if you had really well-drained soils. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find data online that will enable us to remotely calculate the curve number because uh, we don't always have access to the watershed that we're trying to analyze. We can't go out there and do a soil test. We can't go out and do our own aerial survey of what's uh, urban, you know, what areas are vegetated and so on. Um, so we have to use remote sensing data to do that for us. Now, one of the uh, tools that is sometimes useful for um, opening the types of data that we're going to download is Google Earth Pro. And it's just in the last couple of years that they've made that free uh, in the past, you either had to pay or get a special academic license to use Google Earth Pro, but um, you can think of it as a, like a GIS 
without having to pay the huge licensing fees that you'd see for some other applications. It allows you to uh, look at the digital elevation model, measure areas, import shape files, and so um, I sometimes use it just for kind of overlaying the uh, soil data on top of an area that I know is a watershed of interest. And I think I've showed you before um, one of the cool terrain features that's available in Google Earth Pro. And that is that you can pivot around and get a sense for, in three dimensions, um, the, uh, the elevation of a watershed. And so I'm looking for, here they are. All right. You can uh, tilt downward and through rotating around, get a perspective of, of the elevation model. And of course, you probably noticed before that down here on the lower right hand side, you can drag the cursor and it'll tell you the elevation at all these locations. And so Google didn't generate this data. It's called a digital elevation model. And it's the same data that our WMS program is going to use to get a sense of um, where ridge lines are, where are the low points that a stream would form. And so it's going to look at this same data. This is a very unusual formation that we have these uh, parallel streams. Usually it's far more random than having these parallel streams. That's why it always kind of cat catches my eye. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, uh, the soil in the area using a, uh, a website called the Web Soil Survey. So the Web Soil Survey, if you, uh, in, your, uh, in your browser, would just Google Web Soil Survey, I think this is going to be the first thing that comes up. You don't necessarily have to type that link. But um, if you just go Web Soil Survey, it's this first one that we want to look at. Start WSS. Now, in the past, I've had some browser issues with this website, but I don't recall whether it was Chrome that didn't work or whether it was Firefox that didn't work. Hopefully, they've got it sorted out, whatever it was. Um, but we're going to do a couple of things just to look at the data that's available. Um, the first thing that you notice is that it's just your typical um, window for browsing through an area of interest. And so um, it'll probably start with the entire United States zoomed out and you know, zoom in on West Virginia and try and get Cabell County in your crosshairs. Using the freeways is a pretty good method of identifying the cities when the labels aren't shown too clearly. And so if um, you look at the intersection of uh, I-64 and 77, that's Charleston. Zoom in on Cabell County. Oh, I think I've gone the wrong direction. Okay, so. So let's choose, uh, just try and zoom in on Milton. Now, it's going to be uh, getting, it has access to a couple of different data sets. Uh, a low resolution soil data set called StatsGo and a high resolution data set called Surgo. And it's Surgo, this high resolution one, that WMS is going to use to calculate curve numbers. And so uh, let's familiarize ourselves with uh, the density of soil polygons with Sergo. Uh, the first thing you have to do is define an area of interest. And at this point, we're still probably zoomed in, uh, not zoomed in enough because there's going to be such a high density of soil polygons. And so um, does everybody see this Mill Creek stream? It's north of Milton. 
it doesn't really matter necessarily if we're all zoomed in on exactly the same area but um, get a uh, a section of the map to where you're zoomed in about at this level and so let's see it's got a uh, a scale across the bottom and so what I'm looking at right now the width of that is probably three miles wide three miles tall and you can define an area of interest and so across the top here if you look at the uh, the controls there was the zoom in zoom out pan tool what we want to do is uh, define an area of interest and so if you click on this and then you encompass the area that you want to get the soil data for then it creates the area of interest and the thing that's kind of nice about that is that you're going to be able to uh, export the soil data that's within this area of interest and so we've created a, an area of interest and um, in the soil map tab that's a little bit further across the top so it's the next one over from defining the area of interest if you click on the soil map then it tells you inside that area of interest what are the characteristics of the soil and so it kind of does a, a weighted average of each of the uh, soil types and now we can see these uh, polygons that have to do with the soil types and the thing that maybe jumps out at you is that these soil type polygons look a little bit like um, contours of an elevation map and um, you know that's not random what what they've done is they know that typically in streams for example they would have one type of soil um, at the top of a ridge line of a hill there would be a more resistant soil and so they're kind of extrapolating and interpolating by assigning uh, the soil types that it knows are characteristic of the low point in a watershed to the, uh, the stream elevations. Uh, the more resistant soils within an area they are assigning to the hilltops and kind of extrapolating in between the different grades and uh, soil type characteristics that are in each of these. And the thing that's interesting is you can click on, let's see what's the most common soil type in this area of interest. 24 percent Gilpin Upshore. And so if you click on that it'll give you a description of what is in Gilpin Upshore Complex. And so it's saying that this soil type is assigned to areas that have 35 to 70 percent slopes. And so that's very steep. Um, but part of how it assigned um, each of these areas where it has Gilpin Upshore is the, uh, the slope. Uh, the, it's also assigned based on the elevation range, so uh, 520 to 1500 feet. And then there are some um, information about the soil properties themselves. You can see the hydrologic soil group is down here under the interpretive groups. And so any place that it has this Gilpin Upshore, it's going to assign, when we import it to WMS, one of the uh, characteristics that's in the database file would be the hydrologic soil group. Um, you'll notice that it has a uh, transmission capacity of the water, and so this is the infiltration rate that you'd see during a storm, 0.2 to 2 inches per hour, and it's from that that the hydrologic soil group is partly based on. Um, so this is really a pretty in-depth description of the characteristics of that soil. And if you use this uh, identify tool, um, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit further without disturbing our area of interest. Okay, I think it'll still be drawing the soil polygons if we give it a minute. Yeah. All right. So we can click on this identify tool and then it'll show you in any given spot of interest like for instance if you knew that you know this is your property you could click on your property and then it will give you the characteristics of the soil at that location. Now you get a warning that 
we're zoomed in pretty far. Uh, so, you know, they don't guarantee the accuracy of a single point. But extrapolated over a broad area, um, these soil maps do a pretty good job of giving us what we need to calculate the curve number. And so they kind of caution you against assuming that you can click on any particular spot in the watershed and that it's going to definitely be that soil type that, uh, that you're expecting from the database. But, um, you know, if, if there's a, a couple of hundred feet in one direction error and a couple of hundred feet direction error uh, in, the, in the other way, averaged over a multi-acre uh, watershed, it's probably not going to be too much of an issue. So um, it's really a useful way of getting a sense for the soil that is in your watershed. Um, there are some other tabs across the top here in the Soil Data Explorer. You can get an idea of uh, what crops would maybe be suitable for an area of interest. And so if we just look at some of these suitabilities, uh, the ones that maybe have the most hydrologic um, significance would be the forest production. So let's go back to the suitabilities. I don't remember where the forest one was, but if you click on land classifications, you notice that, uh, let's see, farmland classification. it'll generate a report according to each one of these characteristics. And so if you're interested in knowing the, uh, the farming classification, then um, they can, you can see the, the rating for certain parts of the watershed, not prime farmland, farmland of statewide importance. And so they've kind of uh, given you an idea of how much of the area would be arable. I guess you not prime farmland is on top of water. <laughs> I guess maybe unless you're thinking hydroponics. Uh, so any, any sort of implication of the soil is uh, available here in the Explorer. Um, soil health is kind of interesting. Let's take a look at the Fragile Soil Index because scour is an issue that is uh, of real importance. And so let's look at the rating here of the Fragile Soil Index because it's going to show you when there is heavy rainfall where maybe the soil is most threatened. And so, um, you know, if you're going to be disturbing areas with construction, then it would give you an idea of uh, maybe where to focus your... Um, your scour ero and erosion control efforts. So slightly fragile areas, moderately fragile areas. And so you could, if you have a job site in a particular location, maybe get a sense for, do we have any heavily fragile? No. So we only had moderately, slightly, or not rated. But um, we can download this data we can download the, uh, the soil data. Um, I don't remember where we can view the hydrologic soil group. Let's see, soil qualities and features. Soil qualities and features. Hydrologic soil group. All right, this is the one that is most important for calculating curve number. And so if we do the view rating on the hydrologic soil group, now it's going to tell us the percent of A soil, B soil, D soil. So remember that for each one of these different classifications, there's a hydrologic soil group that goes with it. And so this is just some random watershed that is north of Milton. And um, you can see that there's only 1.8% of the watershed is hydrologic soil group A. So besides that, we didn't have any A soils. Uh, there's 
quite a huge percentage of the soil that's classified D, 24%. It's the largest uh, soil, single soil group in this watershed would be hydrologic soil group D. And um, the rest of it would be mostly C soils. All right, so um, let's try downloading that soil data. Um, we've defined an area of interest already. And so at this tab across the top, you can click on download soil data. And um, <clears throat> we've already created an area of interest. And so it gives us some of the characteristics. The area of interest is 3,204 acres. Yours is probably different depending on where you clicked when you're creating it. Uh, we can create a download link, and I think it generates the request in the background. This isn't one of the ones where we have to uh, give it our email address. I think it's uh, quicker than that. So you can see now it's got the soil download link available. It's only 4.6 megabytes. These aren't aerial photos. These are just um, polygons, which are much smaller in size. It's a, uh, a vector data set with a database in the background. So if you download that zip file and just make sure that you save it to a location that you're going to be able to find later. So just in a temporary folder or something. Should download pretty quickly. What I'm hoping we'll be able to do is import that data into uh, Google Earth Pro just so that we can um, get some practice importing a shape file with Google Earth Pro. So the download is almost finished. Did anybody have a file that was significantly larger than 4.6 megabytes? Uh, the other thing it looked at me, but then again, my area is only 10 times bigger than yours. So yeah. Yeah, the bigger the area, the larger that data set's going to be. All right, so um, you have to extract the zip file. So if you click on it and bring it up in uh, the file explorer then across the top here there's the compressed folder tools and what we want to do is we want to uh, click on that compressed folder tools and then extract all and just use the default settings in the wizard that pops up it's going to create a folder that has the same name as the file and then extract all of the uh, sub files that are inside of that archive and uh, there are a lot of them um, you know, all of those different characteristics that we were looking at in the web view have been included in different databases here, some of them bigger than others. The, uh, the main one that we're going to try to import, I'll pause for a moment just to make sure that everybody's got their, all right. So um, the uh, file we're going to try and import, if you navigate inside of the zip file that it's created, in the uh, spatial tab, the biggest, the biggest file you'll notice here is this .shp that is our area of interest. So soil MU, the MU doesn't stand for Marshall University. That's just a coincidence. But um, OK, so that's been um, unzipped. And so now do a file import using Google Earth Pro, file import, and then browse to that location, spatial. And we're going to have to change the, fo the, um, the types. So you see there's this list of different file types. So change it from text.csv to .shp. And so the one that we're looking for is the big, you know, the, the largest file. So soil MU, area of interest, so open. Do you want to apply a style template? Sure. OK, so it's gone and found the database that's associated with these, uh, with these polygons. So you remember that there was the Gilpin Upshore. These abbreviations have to do with the soil type for each of the polygons it's going to draw. 
So we'll just have it do the default thing. Uh, and it's asking if we want to save this style template so we can use it later. So that's fine. What kind of file are you looking for? A shape file. And I guess I didn't turn it on yet. So it's it's here in the places. The shape file is there in the places, but then I think I got to turn it on. Oh, I guess I didn't really like that style template so well. It didn't give me much to look at. I should have paid more attention to importing it. So let me delete that, see if I can do different colors. File, import. Create a new template. OK, color. Don't use a single color. Set color from field. I think that'll make it uh, the field M U S Y M. Use random color. I don't want to assign them all myself. Because we're going to be able to use the same kind of identify tool and look up the properties. But we can't have everything be the same color or else we're not going to be able to click on individual polygons. So it looks like, yeah, with the random colors, I think I'm going to be able to see more. OK, so the thing that I like about this is that now we can uh, toggle between the terrain and the soil and see how, um, how the soil is extrapolated for a given watershed. So if you kind of like pan in on, and we turn on toggling back and forth, you can see that the, the ridge line, which is a more resistant soil, has a different color than the low points. And so they've assumed that because it's lower in elevation, it must be this less resistant soil. And they went out maybe and surveyed in half a dozen or maybe a dozen sites in this area. You know, what kind of soil did they have in these low regions? And then they assign uh, the typical slope and elevation and um, sometimes they're taking the, the shape of the contours into effect as well, not just the elevation, but looking at adjacent cells and kind of making it continuous. And so there wasn't somebody <coughs> who went to this particular hauler and uh, did a bunch of soil samples, but the watersheds that we're going to be interested in <coughs> are going to be relatively large. And so, you know, if we... <coughs> If we are trying to quantify the flow coming out of this watershed, then it may be that the soil data is, you know, the extents could be actually a couple hundred feet one direction or another. But when you average it over the large watershed, it's not going to have as uh, big effect as, um, as you might expect. And so the overall weighted average that it calculates will be uh, highly accurate. So this is just a sense of the, uh, the soil type data that's available. And um, we can get the uh, area properties of different polygons. The one other thing I want to show you is um, what's called the National Land Cover Database. And it's where we can get what's on top of the soil. And um, it used to be that you could download individual state, states from the national map. But when I was checking this out, it seems like uh, in recent months they now uh, require you to download the entire United States. You can't just get individual states. and so. Uh, I started that download before coming to class, and um, let's see, it was 1.4 gigabytes, so you probably wouldn't be able to get it in time to pull up, but let me see if I can extract that and then open it. Such a big file, I'm worried that um, Google Earth may not have the memory to open it, but we'll see. Uh, what the national land cover is is um, 
It's a uh, basically a picture, an aerial photo of of the United States, and they assign different colors to um, account for a different land cover. And they do it. The cell size, I think, is around 30 meters by 30 meters, and so that means that. The U.S. Is, is broken up into 30 meter cells and in each one of those cells they assign whatever is the predominant land cover in that area. So if it's a lake then it would be assigned that water characteristic that we were looking at. Um, so all across the state of West Virginia in a 30 by 30 matrix they're assigning these different land characteristics. Let's see if we'll be able to import this. I haven't used the, they do it I think about every five years. They come up with a new land cover database. Um, and uh, the most recent one was from 2016. The thing that's kind of interesting is you can go back through time and look at how the land cover has changed in certain spots. And so you can see, for instance, you know, the big Amazon call center that's out at Kinetic Park, like um, off of Hal Greer as you go towards the highway. You can look at the land cover database and you can see how development has encroached on what previously was raw land. And you can do analysis of before and after development uh, by using this data and looking at um, what used to be in a location versus what's there now. Um, what we'll be looking for once it finishes unzipping this is a, a TIFF file. And a, a TIFF file is just an image file that is uh, compressed with a uh, lossless compression system rather than a JPEG compression which is lossy. Oh, 16 gigabytes, that's huge. I may not be able to open this. I think they've changed the format since the last time I opened it. Well, I'm going to have to get back, back to you on how to use the land cover uh, because they've changed the file format since the last year that I downloaded. But I'll get, I have some old land cover files that we can use and of course WMS imports them automatically. We're out of time anyhow. Um, just a reminder that uh, if you want to pick a different topic for your research paper. Just run it by me first to make sure that we're on the same page, that it would be suitable. Uh, the next homework assignment I'm going to put up later this afternoon, homework 8, it'll be due a week from today. And it's going to be covering unit hydrographs and time of concentration. We've already talked a little bit about unit hydrographs and we're going to continue that on Wednesday as well as uh, how we use the time of concentration methods that you learned earlier in the semester with the sheet flow how we can expand that into time of concentration for an entire watershed that includes more than just sheet flow. So that's it for today. I'll see you on Wednesday.